Hi everyone, I'm Hector Moran and I'm a 3D character artist and this will be my presentation for the Pixel of this year. Uh, I go by the handle Sculptor Heck in social media so you can find me in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and my website is heck.mx so you can find more of my work there. Um, I've been in the video games industry since about 2005 uh, I started working in 3D print projects since about 2009, so going into 10 years in, in the, those areas. And in 3D printing, I've made a lot of characters for miniatures, toys, and collectible statues. I am originally from Mexico. I was born there and I lived on there until I was 16. Then I moved to the U.S. and I went to high school and college there. I went to a university where I studied computer animation. So that's where I learned to use Maya and all these uh, basic uh, programs that were um, yeah, involved in digital arts back then. I got my first job offer in the Netherlands and um, that was around 2005 so i've been living in europe since and basically i lived in the netherlands for about three years uh, germany for about a year and i've been living here in austria since around 2010. Um, my first game art uh, job was at streamline studios in the netherlands and uh, I started as an environment artist. I wanted to be a character artist since the beginning, but uh, when you get your start in the industry, you start where you basically are offered a position. And uh, I worked my way up to lead artist in that studio, and I worked in games like Saints Row, uh, Saints Row 2, Battlefield 2142, uh, Unreal, uh, Overlord, and yeah. Then after about three years of working in that studio, I wanted to join a full game development studio. So I applied around and I got an offer in a studio in Vienna. Uh, that studio was called Sproing and I worked on several small games there like for Wii and uh, for PlayStation 3. And while I was working at that studio, I started getting some uh, freelance job offers and by around 2012, after three years of that studio, I decided to just become a full-time freelancer. And here you can see some of the clients that I've, I've worked for since 2012. Um, yeah, so some of these are, are game studios, some of these are animation studios, um, some of them are outsourcing studios, and some of them are miniatures studios and toy companies so yeah small big uh, clients um, and big and small uh, projects so some of the ips that i've had a chance to work on for example have been uh, league of legends i made a few skins for for that game back in uh, 2012. Uh, i made a cup uh, a skin for for fortnite uh, last year and um, i was i was gonna be basically in a team to make more skins for for that game but i had to choose between that and building the all of the miniature set uh, the entire miniature set for darksiders uh, so i did that instead with uh, some friends of mine um a couple of years ago i got to work on the street fighter miniatures game and i did the entire miniature cities for that one so 38 miniatures for it I got my start in miniatures by working on Kingdom Death, and Kingdom Death is a pretty popular uh, game in the in the field of, of uh, miniatures and, and board games. I got to work on the Mega Man um, board game, and last year um, with some friends of mine, I worked on the Mortal Kombat miniatures game and a couple other IPs like Men in Black and Ghostbusters, and a couple of others that I can't talk about this year. Um, so yeah, continuing on. So what we're going to try to cover is going to be some of the, what I consider to be important steps, uh, in, in kind of going from a 2d concept into a, a 3d, um, character or a 3d piece. And, uh, yeah, some of those are collecting and studying your references starting to work symmetrically some of these are pretty basic but you gotta start somewhere 
um, than organizing into big shapes, medium shapes, and small shapes, or primary forms, uh, secondary forms, and tertiary forms. Um, then in some cases you will also be doing pose and pose matching. Um, then in most projects, be that miniatures, statues, collectibles, um, you are going to be doing some filling in the blanks. Uh, we'll get into that. And uh, yeah, working out the main angles of your, of your character, of your figure. And uh, yeah, we'll get into what I call finish drawing the owl. And um, a bit about presentation. So this, this is not going to be about how to use ZBrush or any of those things. It's a pretty short presentation, so that would take a long time. But basically, if you already kind of know your way around your 3D program, like Blender or Maya, 3D Max, whatever it is you use, um, if you have uh, some extent of art training or self-taught practice, um, this might help you get started. And uh, yeah, of course, like for for 3D and 3D character art, it, it's not necessarily to know how to draw, but it helps. And uh, you don't need to already be a good artist to go from 2D into 3D or to even start in 3D without having 2D. But you got to start somewhere, right? So collect and study your references. So what does this refer to? Well, basically, in architecture, for example, you have your floor plan, right? It's, it's how you how you build a house, and as you as you're doing that, um, you're gonna need to kind of use your floor plan as your map to go where you're going, and it's similar in three D art and with characters. Um, but um, one thing I've noticed uh, with a lot of uh, projects and in more recent uh, years is that. Um, full on model sheets that are very specific and very tight are not really around anymore. What you get is often just one good piece of concept art and you have to kind of go from there, especially in smaller scale projects like miniatures. Um, so yeah, model sheets are kind of dead. Long live model sheets. Uh, <clears throat> So yeah, continuing on about the subject of collecting and studying refs, like I was saying, um, in most in most projects, like miniatures, you get one good drawing and that's it. And uh, there's often uh, no time or no budget or just no need for that because a good con a good uh, 3D artist, a good uh, miniature artist, a good uh, collectibles sculptor and and um, game artist. Uh, they kind of just know their way around uh, proportion and, and anatomy and things like that. So the, the job kind of expects you in some cases to just go from a pretty, pretty simple 3D, I mean, a pretty simple three quarter uh, piece of concept art. And yeah, you're on your own, kid. So yeah, this is where your Google Foo, uh, your ability to just search for good references and organize them well uh, will help you. Um, you can use programs like Pure Ref, where you can organize your images and just have them all saved in a collage in a setup. So here you have a screenshot, basically, of the concept art for that I got for this character, and um, that concept art is by Derek Laufman. And next to it, you see a photo of Dan Aykroyd from the Ghostbusters movie, then the 3D model from the Ghostbusters game that came out some years ago. And then some screenshots or photos of um, of toys and uh, cartoons from uh, of the Ghostbusters. Especially, uh, I looked for a lot of pictures of the back, and you'll see you'll see why. Uh, but yeah, basically, you you have to be resourceful and kind of just fill in the blanks uh, with things like that when it comes to references. So, starting symmetrically um, in most programs. Uh, out there basically all programs you will be starting symmetrically either from a sphere or from a box that you will start extruding polygons from so yeah most uh, characters most projects uh, that have symmetry will start with automatic symmetry in a 3d program and uh, if you have armor and things like that yeah it makes sense to take advantage of, of that uh, but then with some characters, um, you you end up posing them, you end up changing things, 
but still you want both legs or both boots and both gloves to be the same size and things like that so symmetry right um going into big medium and small shapes um basically what that means is physically what is the bigger shapes um but also you can talk about it in the sense of primary secondary and tertiary forms and uh, again this this goes into like proportions and 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 the scale of things and also to an extent the hierarchy of importance of things in most projects uh, micro details like pores and things like that are not that important uh, if you're doing realism, yes, they become important, but they are not what makes uh, a character uh, look good. Um, so, so yeah, you start building all the pieces, building all the parts. And, uh, yeah, some of these uh, big shapes will be physically big, as in the entire body. But then the body itself will be composed of uh, its own big, medium, and small shapes, like the entire body is going to be one big shape, right? Then the torso is still kind of one large shape, but then you start getting into the head or maybe the legs. Those are kind of medium sized shapes. And then you go into something as small as fingernails or even eyelashes and things like that. Then those start becoming really small shapes. Or you can call them also micro details in some cases like pores and things like that. But the hierarchy is, is, uh, is kind of, organized by by the size and, and the importance uh, in a way because um, if you start putting in pores in something that doesn't have the primary shapes taken care of um, you're not getting really anywhere um, you're kind of wasting your time you need to take care of those primary and secondary and tertiary forms first um, so that everything that you put on top of that is on a good foundation so you have even situations like for example here when i was blocking in this uh, bullfighter mm, he has he's of course made of large shapes like his cape or his uh, his bullfighter pants and then medium shapes like his shoes or even his head would be a medium uh, size shape but at the same time his face itself has its own large medium and small shapes that you need to kind of take care of and 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 make sure that they are correct so so that by the time you are doing things like the filigree on his uh, on his outfit the golden ornaments all of those things are falling into the right position and they are at the right proportion and um, they are on a good foundation basically so with miniatures statues and collectibles and things like this you you are going to be posing characters with video game characters you finish with the t-pose and and that's where most of those projects uh, end for the character artist unless you are also the rigger of the project um so in in the case of of something like this this is a fan art that i made of uh, of john wick based on on art by derek laufman and you can see here that at this point i've taken care of all the symmetric stuff i've taken care of building all of his pieces like his gun his guns were built symmetrically and then placed in position where they're going to be in relation to the post um, his hair i started sort of symmetrically but then i started making it very specific to the to the drawing and then the pose of course you start kind of getting in there and when i when it comes to posing i use the transpose system inside of zbrush and uh, so so basically transpose is the system inside of zbrush that allows you to do posing without knowing rigging it's uh, it's a very cool system because um last time i did rigging i was basically a few years out of uh, graduating uh, graduated from school so i don't really know much about modern rigging and i'm not interested in in it it's not something that i i need to do or want to do especially when I have tools like Transpose inside of ZBrush. So with Transpose, you're basically able to mask your, your parts of the body, and then you can soft, soften that mask, blur it, and then bend the body um, carefully. 
and start moving all of these things into place so that um, you you start matching what the what the drawing is. Some things get built or get sculpted or created uh, completely in pose. Like for example, here you can see the smoke that is coming out of his head. That is built basically with Dynamesh and that's just sort of built already in, in uh, a lot of it in, in posts and so that I can just match it as much as possible to the drawing. So yeah, that's the some of the basics about how I go about posing inside of ZBrush. Um, another important thing about posing in ZBrush is that um, I like having a good uh, basic body underneath um that has decent deformation like the shoulders are not too squished or the elbows are not uh looking like a bent pipe things like that so that uh, when you start posing the clothing and posing the armor and the props all of that is in a good foundation again this kind of follows the same logic as this medium the the big medium and small shapes the hierarchy of of things the in this case the the part that is at the top of the hierarchy when it comes to posing is having a good basic body underneath things and um i do that because i i did do um, physical sculpting um, a long time ago before i went into university for digital arts and um, here i'm showing some some sculpts by uh, tk miller tim miller and um you can see here that he often works the proportions and even the musculature of the basic body underneath so that as, as he starts putting in clothing and all the other details all of these things are on a good foundation um, so filling in the blanks filling in the blanks uh, refers to things like for example in this case I didn't get a back view sketch of, of these guys. I, I don't know what uh, what Derek Laufman's version of a proton pack uh, might look like uh, for this project, but I know what these look like in different video games or in different cartoons and different iterations of the Ghostbusters. So I looked up references for that and I basically made my own version of the proton pack. Um, then I ran that by my client and they said, yes, go ahead, this looks cool. I also was not provided a back view of, for example, what Ray's hair here uh, might look like. And I don't need that. I, I know I've done enough characters and I know enough about basic design and sculpting to where I can just extrapolate based on the what things look like in the front of the drawing and maybe even to an extent what the this haircut looks in the, on the actor from from the back so you want to be like mr wolf from pulp fiction you want to just if you encounter these little problems just solve them just get through them solve them for your clients so that they don't even need to think about these things and then they if many of them will notice like oh I, we didn't even need to give uh, these references to this guy and he figured it out and that's great you know so Sometimes filling in the blanks also means uh, visual development uh, or look dev. And uh, that means that in some projects you're given a 2D character that is, uh, has only been uh, drawn so far. And uh, for example, this was um, Embla, I think. Her, it was for a project for Snowprint and King, uh, a game called Legend of Soulguard. And this was for the animated trailer for that game and um, so I had to help my client uh, collaborate with them on basically designing her look in 3D. Here you see some of the iterations that she went through. The part that went through the most iterations I believe was the face uh, but also some of the stylization of the proportions of her hands and little things like that. Uh, those went through some stages as we figured out the kind of style that they wanted to go for. Uh, so here you have another example from that same project. This is a uh, Grimchop. He's a dwarf from that same project. And as you can see in the concept art in the drawing, he was very stumpy and very stylized. So he was kind of a ball. And uh, so I first adapted him very close to that kind of version of himself. Um, but then as we were figuring out the art style, he had to had to fit in with, uh, with the other characters and with Embla, for example, who looks a lot more human. 
So that meant that we had to kind of dial back and forth the style of, of, uh, of this character until we figured out, okay, this is it. This is the way we want to go. And it's similar for this other character for a racing game for Firebolt games. This is uh, alien girl with pink hair. Um, so again, I was provided a pretty rough sketch of her. Um, and from there, I basically started just kind of developing uh, based on, on projects that I had done before. And um, the this specific client uh, sought me out because they liked other projects that I had done and how I had done the style in those. So yeah, basically here I kind of developed the art style for this character and I helped the client figure out what to these 2D sketches that are not that were not super developed what they would look like in 3D. Um, so yeah, going into the topic of uh, main angles here. Um, so working the main angles refers to usually the back, the front, and the two sides, left and right. Uh, sometimes you also have to present or, or make sure that the three-quarter view, uh, again, depending on the pose, I guess, that that looks good, that that is working out. And uh, these two projects that you see here, one of them was for a client and the other one was just fan art. And uh, so here, Jay from Men in Black, Agent uh, Jay, you see that he was provided in that one frontal main angle. And then from that, I kind of make my T model, IT pose model, then I start posing it, I'd match the pose, but then I also have to make sure that his silhouette and, and, uh, and his details look good from the back and from the sides, right? So, so that's where you kind of have to make sure that the silhouette is holding up because uh, in some in many cases like good concept art is going to have good silhouette anyways so the front angle of this piece of concept art looks very good that means that if you do your job right um, the other angles should look pretty good um, so yeah here you have another example so this is uh, strife from uh, darksiders and this was from the board game. So here I basically, I came up with this pose myself. The client didn't provide a, a pose for this, this figure. Um, and basically I, I decided to, to make this pose where he's kind of moving back, but also shooting uh, in front of him. So the, the thing that I had to, that I wanted to make sure here uh, of is that for example, things like his cape and the fabric that he has hanging from him. Um, of course, it needs to be pretty thick for print because this is going to be printed pretty small. But it also has to have a good silhouette and good flow as it's kind of indicating the movement of what he's doing, right? So I, I make sure that the front angle, most of all, has a good silhouette. If the front angle has a good silhouette, the back angle is most likely not going to have too, too much trouble having good silhouette. And then you have to make sure that the left and the right side look as good as possible within reason as far as the context of the, the pose and the, and the main um, angle that you're working from. So drawing the owl, drawing the owl um, is, yeah, it's just as simple as draw two circles and then just draw the rest of the owl. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, when you're a beginner, when you're getting started in uh, something like 3D, um, it can be quite overwhelming. It's it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to learn. Uh, it's the same with uh, with drawing too, of course. But at the same time, like the thing that is very true about this meme about draw the rest of the owl is that um, you just have to get in there. You have to start somewhere, right? So I'm gonna break down a few more sub tips that I have in relation to drawing the owl and uh, yeah so basically this uh, this relates to to um, uh, something that I used to ask my students when I used to teach in Vienna and it's that uh, that silly riddle of how do you eat an elephant and the answer is one bite at a time and um, yeah in this case that means that learning to to model 3d characters or even learning to draw it's it's uh, something that you have to kind of take in steps and and work your way from less complex things to more complex things. So that's where I, I say 
uh, I would recommend to students and to people learning uh, this start small start with a bust or a chibi don't tackle a full character this is the first time you're you're going into something like this um, so yeah and then one of the tips that I recommend uh, that uh, I didn't used to do this myself but as I started to do it it really it really helped me and that is uh, work with colors early on and um, you'll see why and uh, when I get to that point start learning anatomy as soon as possible and yeah some of these things are, are kind of obvious maybe you've heard them before or maybe um, yeah it's uh, it's a bit um, goes without saying but it it's still worth mentioning um, uh, stick to the plan uh, you'll see what I mean by that and then learning the super s so start small with a bust or a chibi so um, art station is one of the main places where artists digital artists get together share their work and kind of show off their skills and potentially get offers for gigs and for jobs uh, i i have an art station account myself i've gotten a lot of projects uh, from having my portfolio there so yeah it's a sort of standard place where people congregate and um, you'll see that if you click on the on the subsection of character models uh, you'll see a lot of busts and you'll see um, a lot of close-ups of characters why because this is very engaging this is um, humans engage each other with their faces right we we talk to each other face to face not anymore at this moment with the pandemic but yeah um, this is uh, what humans do. Humans uh, are interested in faces and uh, when it comes to character art, um, one way to get started or one way to kind of work your way up is to start small, to start basically uh, with a chibi character, which is a, tends to be a, st a stylized simplification of a full character. Or you can start with a bust. You can do a more complex character, but only make the bust of it. So for example, here in just this capture that I have of ArtStation um, trending section, you can see a bust of Beethoven, for example. So Beethoven, um, everyone knows uh, who, who, who he was, uh, at least the basics and the um, some of what he he looked like based on on drawings and and, and things that we have on record and uh, you can you don't if you're gonna make a a, a piece of 3d art um, based on him you don't necessarily need to make a full character out of him and what what this artist decided to do is that i'm just gonna make a bust and uh, that's that's all he needed and wanted to do because he wanted to focus on that uh on the face on the likeness on the realism and all these things and so you don't always need to make a full character you don't always need to tackle everything in one go so again one way of kind of piecemeal eating the elephant is uh, starting with just parts of the of of a character if you are very early stages uh in your in your um, journey to to this kind of thing uh you will have to do exercises like a single hand or a single foot and uh, a torso um so that you can kind of work out the complexities of those parts on their own and when you know how to do those parts you'll be able to tackle a, a full character later uh, with more ease so uh, so yeah, both bust projects and GB projects allow you to to kind of do that. Um, I like doing fan art. I like doing a lot of uh, fan art and uh, and personal projects. Most of my personal projects are fan art, and uh, they're they're a very really nice way of experimenting and kind of trying to figure out if you can do something or how fast you can do something. So in the case of, for example, this Disney Infinity fan art of the X Men. I wanted to do, see if I could match the art style of the Disney Infinity uh, game that had other characters, um, not the X-Men. And uh, I wanted to see if I could get this to really look like the like it was a release that was going to come from the official game. I actually did fool some people into thinking that. 
Um, but the important thing about this exercise is that it allowed me to take away a lot of details that are not necessary and work with very clean, very simple shapes where you have to make sure that all the lines of the silhouette and all the shapes are as good as possible and that they have a balance of sharp corners and uh, sharp angles and nice uh, soft transitions of shape and silhouette. So, so yeah, um, another aspect about that um, is uh, working with colors early on. Um, I also I also started doing that at some point and uh, I started realizing that it, it helped me a lot uh, on figuring out how close or how far I was from matching the the concept art provided or my objective um, because a lot of what is character art and even portrait art whether you're drawing a portrait or you're uh, sculpting it uh, you're kind of measuring distances you're measuring the distance between the two eyes you're measuring the distance between eyes and, and mouth and the bottom of the nose all these measurements uh, will help you find your way and uh, sometimes color if uh, if you can use color zones to help you find those measurements between the landmarks uh, then you basically will have um, a, a, an easier time making sure that proportionally you are matching what you need to to match uh, easier so <laughs> yeah Learn anatomy. Learning anatomy is something that um, every character artist or every artist in general, concept artist, if you want to do characters, if you're not doing environments, yeah, it's it's a must. You have to you have to do it. You have to get in there. You have to dig in, and you have to keep digging. Um, when I started in in uh, in art in general, I was just. Uh, basically drawing in my notebooks and things like that and uh, when i was a teenager i started kind of buying anatomy books and uh, in fact the first anatomy book that I, book that i bought for myself is the atlas of human anatomy for the artist by stephen roger uh, peck stephen rogers peck and um yeah, I started copying the skeletal and muscle diagrams from there as a way to try to memorize them and learn them. And um, at some point I thought I had learned enough basic anatomy and then I started a couple of years ago uh, working on Street Fighter, uh, the miniatures game. And uh, I started realizing, oh my God, I really need to dig deeper into anatomy. So I went ahead and took the Scott Eaton anatomy course. And um, that is an in-depth course that shows you basically origins and insertions of muscles. Um, rather teaching you, he teaches you names and he teaches you a lot of important things, but um, he teaches you how the muscles attach and how the muscles intertwine and overlap each other and the function that they they mostly uh, play and as soon as you start understanding that more in depth you start having an easier time constructing the anatomy of, of your characters especially if you're building characters in post so it's a it's a very important subject that you can start learning very early on and it's going to take years to to master depending on how much you kind of dig into it um, but I find it to be a fun and interesting subject anyway, so I, I like kind of uh, learning um, more about uh, deep anatomy and, and, and basically how, especially things like the forearms and the back muscles, they are, those are the two uh, hardest systems for most artists to understand and, and kind of become um, able to, to portray correctly. Um, so yeah, dig in, get in there, buy some books, uh, do some anatomy courses. There are lots of them online out there uh, if you if you want. And um, there's also places that sell uh, 3D scans that you can use to rotate them and study and look around. So so yeah, do do some anatomy research, study some anatomy, get in there and uh, have fun because it is a pretty fun subject. Um, stick to the plan um yeah 
So sometimes when we are doing fan art or when we are doing projects for ourselves that are not for clients, um, we, we end up kind of giving ourselves some liberties, some freedoms. And then I've seen it a lot with, with students where they say, I'm going to make a portrait of this actor. And then halfway down the project is like, oh, but now I'm going to make it into my own character. And it, they start coming up with excuses to basically not finish or not continue the hard part, which is matching that likeness, which is finishing that specific project that you started. Um, then the, pro the project starts kind of getting derailed and you go off the tracks and then you end up completely lost in some cases. You end up throwing away the project or wasting a lot of time. If you're going to try to match a piece of 2D concept art, um, try to stick to it as close as you can. Try to match things as one-to-one -one as you are able um, because that is very often the job. That is the, the job when you are given a miniature to make, a statue to sculpt uh, for a collectible, uh, a toy to, to make for a toy company. Um, and that is also what you have to do with, uh, with the concept art that you're given in, uh, in, a, in an existing game. Um, especially with projects, uh, for example, Fortnite and League of Legends already have a lot of their character models and their art style established. So if you're going to do those jobs, you have to match what they give you. And then you sometimes you have to even use their base models. So you have to become able to s just matching as close to one to one as possible to what you're given, because uh, yeah, that is that is very often the job. And if you're a student and you are trying to, to learn this, um, stick to the plan. Pick, pick a piece of concept art that you're going to be making a 3D version of and get in there and, and make it as close as you can. And uh, this is another, um, another tip that I, I found uh, in Twitter. Um, some, it, was, it was not even that long ago. And um, I was like, oh, man, this summarizes so well, basically, what what uh, what makes the difference for a lot of projects and a lot of stylizations is that um, this is uh, from Folygon. I, I forget the, the artist's name, but uh, if you search Folygon on Twitter, you will find them. And um, so you can see here with this, like you could think of this as, as uh, for example, Venom, uh, his tongue. Uh, his and the or or yeah whatever detail this is it could be a piece of uh, hair um but you can just make a kind of boring s curve which can be okay for some projects uh or you can take things to the next level and basically make like really nice curves that lead into a peak that pinches and then um yeah basically make a more interesting shape make a more interesting stylization and uh, this is something that i i learned this a long time ago in some of the projects that i worked on in video games um but this has kind of become more and more consistent and more and more important for for basically na nailing uh the look of uh of a lot of the projects that i've i've had to work on so so yeah kind of if you understand this image and you apply what it what it shows you, uh, it's gonna it's gonna only help you. So this is uh, when when you apply this to, for example, how I applied it to these miniatures, um, you will get a message like this, which is this is a message from a person that was painting the official uh, box art for these uh, miniatures, and uh, she's saying these. Uh, these are exceptionally sculpted. Uh, she appreciates all the subtle angles and shapes when painting. And uh, yeah, if you're doing your job right, if you're doing kind of uh, would if you're bringing um, your your knowledge of, of, of shapes and design and, and, and anatomy and all these things into into what you're doing and you're stylizing things correctly, uh, you will get something that is more appealing and that works better. So. A bit about presentation so when it comes to to that stuff um, you can make renders that look very graphic and kind of stylized and you can compose them in, in Photoshop for example these are from Street Fighter and these are renders from ZBrush 
that I rendered in passes and then I put together in Photoshop. And so I wanted to match the graphic look of Street Fighter 4 uh, kind of marketing art. So I did these uh, for my Street Fighter miniatures and then I basically composed them together in Photoshop. Um, another way of presenting your work is gonna be with programs uh, like um, Keyshot. Keyshot has a bridge that is direct into, into uh, um, ZBrush and Keyshot have a bridge basically where you can take your model from ZBrush straight into Keyshot and basically um, you can do a lot of uh, quick rendering with the materials that exist there. Sometimes I also post or publish projects just with the photos of the physical miniature painted especially if you get to work with some of the best miniatures paint miniature painters out there uh, in those cases um, yeah might as well use those amazing paint jobs that the miniature painters do this is Kirill Kanaev uh, so this is a miniature that I made some years ago uh, for Chimera min uh, models and uh, yeah you can see that he did an amazing job with the paint job so why not show that off um, another way of presentation of course you can see here um, this is these are um, the final images that I made with Marmoset uh, Toolbag and uh, Marmoset Toolbag is just a, a real-time viewer where you can basically take your your models and just preview them right there in uh, in real time you can bring in your poly paint or bring in your textures and then see all of that with better lighting and better um, post-processing effects so for example here you can see this is my little John Wick in toolbag and uh, you can see that when I rotate it gets a little bit grainy and then it recovers because it's basically quick rendering in real time uh, this is the beta uh, version of um, of Toolbag 4, but uh, yeah, you can see here really quickly in real time what your light setup um, might look like, and uh, yeah, this this stuff is great. I I love uh, I love playing around uh, with Toolbag because I'm. I'm not that technical when it comes to rendering, so Toolbag has has given me a really good way of uh, of presenting my my models, and uh, so I like using uh, Toolbag. I also used it for all these Ghostbuster uh, models. So yeah, the recap: um, collect and study your references. Start working symmetrically. Uh, big shapes, medium shapes, small shapes, or primary, secondary, and tertiary forms. Um, posing and matching the pose, filling in the blanks, um, working out the main angles, uh, finishing drawing the owl. We went into those uh, sub tips regarding that. And um, yeah, when it comes to presentation, you can use different tools like uh, Keyshot, or you can also go into Maya, Blender, and uh, of course, then if we if we go back to to things like uh, presentation, um, you you have to kind of start practicing and learning a bit about lighting. About for example, this is a three point light setup, so it's a frontal light and two uh, side lights, and the lighting here is is very intentionally um, stylized, so it's it's very kind of extreme uh, situation a lot of how you how you end up seeing in the in the John Wick movies or posters so basically I was I was trying to mimic some of that and um, this was textured with substance so texturing is its own bag of cats uh, that you kind of uh, dig into but um, but yeah when it comes to, to presentation uh, there's a lot to to again to dig into there uh, but yeah, the main thing is like kind of take care of these things that we that we talked about and very likely your 3D adaptation of, of a piece uh, will work out pretty well. So yeah, this is uh, the moment where I say do or do not. There is no try. 
and uh, some of you might say, okay, boomer. Um, so yeah, this would be the moment uh, for questions, so we'll see. And uh, so that was my presentation, and I hope you liked it. I hope you learned a thing or two, and uh, I'll see you around.